Thank you so much for joining us here in the Dweck Center at Brooklyn Public Library. My name is Meredith Walters, and I'm the Acting Director of the Programs and Exhibitions Department. And uh, welcome you all, and please welcome Vince Apola. He's the president of the, the Municipal Art Society. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. We are so happy to be here tonight in this really marvelous uh, institution. Uh, thank you all for joining us for tonight's Arts Forum, and uh, thanks again to the Brooklyn Public Library for having us in this really terrific space. Thank you, Meredith, for that very nice introduction. Uh, MES is very pleased to continue the long tradition of the Arts Forum, which is a new program for us, but I know many of you are quite familiar with this uh, really fantastic series. Uh, it was started by Randy Borscheidt. Um, and produced by the Alliance for the Arts since 1990. Thank you, Randy, for being with us tonight. The Arts Forum has brought the best and brightest in arts innovators in all disciplines from across the country and around the globe, an audience that is dedicated to the cultural field, advocacy, policymaking, and groundbreaking arts leadership. And we are proud to continue this legacy now at MAS under the direction of the wonderful Ann Coates, so thank you for coming tonight. As you may know, MAS is a membership organization, which is important because it means our work reflects what matters to New Yorkers to you, uh, especially on issues that affect the livability and resilience of the city. Last year, MAS interacted with nearly 18,000 people, and this year we want to double that number. So I hope we can count on you to attend our dynamic programming. And if you're not already a member of MAS, here's the pitch. I hope you'll become one tonight. Uh, as a member, you can participate directly in shaping the livability agenda of this city and hold us accountable for ensuring our research, community training, convening, and public programming efforts reflect your concerns. To that end, a quick plug for our next Arts Forum, just 12 days away, which we are co-hosting with the National Arts Funding Collaborative, Art Place. We'll be considering how to measure the vibrancy of places, what makes a place great, exciting, thriving, a vibrantly growing place. Uh, it will be on Tuesday, April 24th. You can get the details online at mas.org, and I hope to see you there. Now on to tonight. Last October, at the MAS Summit for New York City, we convened all three New York City library heads. For the first time in recent history, we think, maybe ever, well, certainly ever for you three, um, and uh, for a panel that was moderated by the great Sam Roberts on the role of libraries as community anchors. It was our most popular summit session, period, and the most watched part of the MAS Summit online. And tonight, we are at it again, and let me tell you, these folks are not easy to schedule, so this is really an exceptional occasion and treat, and for the second time, I mean absolutely amazing. So tonight, Joined by Sam Roberts, we will continue the discussion started at the summit and further explore the vital role of libraries in their communities, especially how branch libraries function as hubs of culture. Joining us tonight to help set the tone for the evening are two prominent advocates for the importance of libraries to our city life. First, I'd like to introduce City Council Member Jimmy Van Bramer. Welcome, Jimmy. A lifelong New Yorker, he served as the Chief External Affairs Officer of the Queens Public Library from 1999 through 2009 as the library's link between community members and government. Jimmy currently chairs the City Council Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations. You will have to explain what that means. Please join me in welcoming uh, Jimmy Van Bramer. Good evening, everybody. And uh, I want to thank uh, Brooklyn Public Library for uh, hosting this uh, wonderful uh, event and uh, the Municipal Arts Society uh, for uh, convening us. And I know uh, uh, Julie Sandoff from uh, the Revson Foundation will speak. Thank you for all the work that you do. Uh, Randy Borscheidt, it is true, you and I see each other every day, apparently, um, in the front row there. 
And uh, I just want to apologize for being a few minutes late. We came in uh, the back way, uh, Linda, and came into the building and got lost in the phalanx of back uh, staircases. Um, but I do want to commend you. You have a beautiful boiler room. In, uh, <laughs> I don't know who we upset when we went into it, but uh, uh, it's lovely and state-of-the-art uh, uh, equipment you've got there. Um, <laughs> So I want to uh, uh, just uh, say how great it is to be here um, and uh, the intersection of libraries and culture and the arts is something that's with me every single day. We just left uh, BAM's 150th anniversary gala which is happening just down the street and uh, uh, it's so good to be here with the three uh, greatest library CEOs uh, in the entire country, Tom Galante, Linda Johnson and Tony Marks. So let's give a round of applause for those three. And Sam Roberts, I have a very, very uh, vital link to the New York Times. My father was a pressman for the New York Times for 35 years uh, before he retired, uh, allowing all of us to read the New York Times uh, at our local public libraries. Uh, so I just, uh, obviously as someone who worked for the Queens Library for 11 years, and then uh, went and got elected and now chair the Cultural Affairs and Libraries Committee. I am someone who believes passionately uh, in the uh, transformative nature of public libraries and in particular the branch libraries uh, and, and believe very strongly that uh, for many, many young people in particular, uh, the first experience that they have uh, with the arts, with uh, uh, culture is at their local public library. For so many young people, the first time that they witness a performance of any kind uh, is one of those wonderful Saturday afternoon programs uh, that they see at their local public library. For many children, the first time that they create something and they, uh, they, they make something with their own hands, they do so after school uh, at the local public library. And the first time they see something that they've created, up on a wall with their name uh, is at their local public library. And for those who are uh, interested in pursuing a future in, in the creative arts, the first time they read about and really start to believe that that could be their future uh, uh, is at the local public library. And that foundation creates, uh, I believe, a city full of people who uh, not only uh, work in the creative arts, but uh, even if they're not fortunate uh, to do so, uh, but they appreciate uh, the, the creative arts and, and the creative community that is so central to the city of New York. So the work that uh, these three uh, uh, chief executives do, uh, and then actually seeing that there's some library staff uh, in uh, the audience, uh, the work that the staff do at the branch level uh, is so, so very important. And uh, obviously, I'm someone who believes that uh, uh, what happens within uh, the walls of a library, like this one, uh, uh, is so important to, to the future of our city and really our civilization. Um, and uh, in certain cases, libraries are works of art uh, themselves. And, uh, and certainly the new library at Hunter's Point uh, in my district is going to be an architectural wonder uh, in, uh, in Long Island City. So there are so many ways in which uh, libraries enrich us all. And uh, I know we're going to hear so much from uh, these three distinguished uh, panelists and also from uh, the Revson Foundation, which is doing so much. And thank you for believing in libraries uh, as much as uh, we all do. And uh, uh, it's a difficult uh, budget year, but how often have you heard me say it's a great budget year for libraries? Um, never, but, um, uh, but uh, we have to fight uh, very, very hard because the $100 million uh, reduction to funding uh, to these three institutions uh, is unfathomable and will never happen, but it'll only happen if we all fight together to restore that funding and one day have more funding for our public libraries so they can have these wonderful institutions. Oh, and uh, I just want to recognize we've been joined by a wonderful colleague of mine uh, from the Brooklyn delegation. We're apparently doing the rounds today in Brooklyn, uh, but Councilman Brad Lander, who's a big supporter of public libraries.
is here. So I know that uh, Council Member Lander uh, will be uh, fighting alongside with me and with everybody here uh, to make sure that we restore that funding and uh, get to a point where, as our colleague Councilwoman Gail Brewer says, that libraries are open seven days a week in the City of New York. So thank you very much, and uh, I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you so much, Jimmy. Thank you, Brad, for joining us tonight, too. Thank you so much. Um, we know it's critical to have the support of elected officials and city staff to keep libraries front and center in the city's budgeting process. But we also need advocates in civil society, community leaders who recognize the value of these libraries, of these spaces, and of the communities they support. We are pleased to have Julie Sandorf, the president of the Charles H. Revson Foundation, with us tonight. Under Julie's passionate leadership, the Charles H. Revson Foundation is providing dynamic and critical funding support to organizations and research projects addressing the crucial role of libraries. Please join me in welcoming Julie Sandorf. Thanks, Vin. Um, Jimmy, you shouldn't feel bad. We got lost on the subway, so it was one of those nights. Um, Thank you to Vin and to MAS for organizing this terrific event and to thanks to Councilman Van, Bra Van Bramer for championing the libraries the way you do. And a special thanks to the three library directors for their incredible leadership and passionate commitment to encouraging every single New Yorker to expand their minds, their horizons, their creativity, their civic engagement through the city's 214 circulating and four research libraries. And thank you to Linda for hosting this event tonight. My mother, who is the daughter of Polish and Russian immigrants, grew up in East Flatbush. She rode her bicycle almost daily to this very library where she discovered Nancy Drew, the Hardy Boys, popular magazines, piano music, and a love of reading and the arts. Her family had very little money, her parents very little formal education, and so the big treat was an occasional movie, pouring through art books at the Brooklyn, Maine, and bringing her treasured novels home to read. She instilled a love of reading and libraries in me by taking me to the library every week when I was a little girl. She'd wander into the adult section and leave me to my own devices in the children's section. And what a feeling of freedom and independence to walk among all those books. And despite the greatest revolution in access to information since the Gutenberg, New York City's public libraries are visited now more than ever. Open to all, they provide free access to knowledge, regardless of one's background, income, educational level, language of origin, immigration status, and personal history. I don't think you can name an institution in this city that better represents the core values of democracy and opportunity for all than our public libraries. And this is a moment of extraordinary opportunity and challenge for New York City's libraries. The potential is enormous. There is a library in almost every neighborhood in New York City and within walking distance of most schools. This community real estate and infrastructure is not only invaluable, but it's irreplaceable. We couldn't afford to rebuild the New York City public library systems. Um, and, and in fact, nobody would even imagine that we could do something as grand as that in, in current days. And the original revolution makes even more important the role of the libraries as the hub of educational and cultural activity. And New York City's three library systems are leading the way. And I just want to give you three small examples. Um, that is a credit to the leadership of the three folks sitting in front of us. T as of today, the Queens Library is the first public library in New York State to lend e-readers loaded with books to their patrons. And the New York Public Library is working with Queens and Brooklyn Public Libraries and the, De and the Department of Education to expand an amazing pilot project that opens the collections of all of the city's public libraries to every school child in the New York City public school system. Virtual libraries in our, private, in our public schools, it's pretty extraordinary. 
And the Brooklyn Public Library has made available print-on-demand publishing to support the burgeoning literary life of this borough. As the libraries have remained true to their core mission, they also address the huge demand and need for computer and internet service, job services, literacy, and, ling and English as a second language services. And as our libraries have served as the gateway to employment, literacy, access to the world via the internet, one could also imagine the libraries serving as the community portals to the city's vast arrays of visual, performing, and literary arts. New York City is the arts and culture capital of America, if not the world. Um, the possibilities given technology are, are limitless. Imagine HD screenings of the greatest performances at Lincoln Center in our public libraries, free of charge to the public. Imagine um, artists using public libraries in their, as workspaces and then doing programs for young people, older people, around the visual arts. Um, it's extraordinary to think about. But I'll also say that in order for our libraries to meet not only the current demands, sustain their, vis their mission of free access to information in the digital age, and be the place where one might be introduced to the city's cultural treasures, the libraries must have an adequate level of financial support. While meeting much greater demands, the libraries have seen their budgets shrink by a cumulative $50 million since 2008. And this year's budget cuts are worse, $95 million in total across the three systems. New York prides itself as the knowledge capital of the world, with access to information driving its competitive edge. Yet the city has fallen far behind competitor cities in expenditures for supporting its most utilized source of information, the public libraries. For example, San Francisco, in San Francisco, uh, the city supports uh, $101 per capita in, for the libraries. In Seattle, $66 per capita. In Boston, $63 per capita to the libraries. Those are our three cities we compete against the most in culture, in high tech, in information and media. What do we do here? In Brooklyn, we're funding at $40 per capita. In Queens, at $46 per capita. It's unacceptable. Great public libraries are vital to making healthy communities and a great city. They need solid financial foundation to transition to the new roles demanded of them. And their potential, if they have this foundation, their potential to transform lives, our communities and our cities, is really only as limited as our imaginations and ambitions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. Thank you for being here. I need to get a little bit more on the act. I, too, worked at a public library. I did, as a high school student, every day after school. Um, and um, so, there, yes. Um, libraries are vital to our communities, neighborhoods, and cities. This is especially true in a city like New York, where a safe public space for people to learn informally, experience culture, and participate in the arts, as Julie said, for free is a scarce commodity. And we know libraries aren't just about books. Last year in New York City, more than 45 million people visited our city's 214 branch and four research libraries. As Cheryl Cohen Efren, uh, Secretary of the Board of the Charles H. Refson Foundation, shared with us at, at the MAS Summit, that's more visitors than to all of our city's cultural and sports venues combined, which is just astounding. Libraries remain as critical as ever in creating, maintaining, fostering our communities. They are hubs, true hubs, of education, of access, of culture. MAS is excited to work with you, our partners and members, to look more closely at the needs of our libraries, particularly our branch libraries that are located in almost every New York City neighborhood. We want to examine what libraries' challenges are and how to boost their capacity to meet neighborhood needs. We began that inquiry at the summit, and we continue it tonight. And I hope you will 
uh, all engage with our findings. We'll be accepting audience questions after the panel discussion. We'll be live tweeting at MASNYC using the hashtag ArtsForum, and taped footage of tonight's event will be available on MAS.org in the coming days. So please join the dialogue with us online. Here with us tonight to engage in a conversation about libraries as culture hubs are Tom Galante, CEO of the Queens Public Library, Linda Johnson, our host, President and CEO of the Brooklyn Public Library, and Tony Marks, President and CEO of the New York Public Library, and our host on April 19th for the Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis Medal Gala, uh, and our moderator, New York Times Urban Affairs Correspondent, Sam Roberts. Come on up. Thank you. Thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, as Vin said, there will be questions uh, at the end from the audience. If you have any questions, there are people walking around with, I think, blue or some color index cards, and you can write your questions on those and hand them in, and we'll try and get to them at the end. We will also get you out of here by uh, 8 o'clock. If you see me looking at my BlackBerry, I'm not expecting a call, but I'm just looking to see what time it is. Uh, I feel like I'm coming home today. I spent probably every weekend growing up in Brooklyn at this library. A little bit of time at the branch on Church Avenue, but most of the time here. And as a journalist, I've often found that librarians and archivists are really my favorite people. I deal a lot uh, with people in government whose job is to withhold information. <laughs> It's a pleasure to deal with people whose job and intent and instinct is to share information. And I thank Julie, and I thank the councilman, uh, and I thank other friends here, Alice Fisher Rubin, and others uh, for doing everything they can to keep this library going as well as it has. We're talking tonight about the library as a culture hub. That is the thrust of our conversation. And we're talking about it at a time when reading is changing dramatically. I can only say to Councilman von Bramer that his father picked the right time to retire as a pressman uh, for the New York Times. Uh, we are still printing the paper, but there are more people reading the Times online now than are reading the print edition of the paper. I will also say that those people are paying less for the paper, less to read the Times than the people who buy the paper in print although it costs the same to produce in terms of staffing and coverage and uh, making the news content as rich as it is. And we are, in fact, delivering more online these days than we are delivering in print. Uh, the challenges of these panelists is to keep up with the technology. Uh, as Julie mentioned before, uh, this Queens Library today began distributing e-books uh, the Brooklyn Public Library is devoting space to artists and rehearsal space. The Manhattan Library, the New York Public Library, is now removing books to some extent at the main research library to make more room for people. And a study by the Pew Charitable Trust, which came out, I think, the end of last month, said that the poor economy has made libraries more important than ever giving them a shadow mandate, as it called it, to become multi-purpose community centers and cultural hubs, a default provider of internet access for people seeking jobs, health information, access to government services, and benefits. I'd like to begin by asking each of the three library heads, first of all, how do you define culture in making the library a cultural hub? And how do you fit that into the rest of your mandate as you perceive it? Linda? Um, thanks, Sam, and um, welcome back. Thank you, a pleasure. <laughs> um, the bear awaits you upstairs. Okay, the bear. The, um, the trick for us in Brooklyn is to serve the community um, and the cultural community in particular, which is so strong here. The obvious ways, um, which you mentioned earlier, are to um, think about um, the arts in the more traditional sense the visual arts, the performing arts, in Brooklyn in particular, um, authors who are working on fiction, nonfiction alike, um, and, and figuring out how to provide spaces that meet 
meets that <laughs> community's needs. But in addition, um, you know, we're trying to think about the library as a laboratory. So it used to be that people came to the library to read and learn about the thoughts and ideas um, of others that were contained in the volumes that um, we housed. And today, with the advent of technology and the ability for people to self-publish, as, uh, as Julie Sandorf mentioned, um, but also to create their own video, um, to express themselves with photography, uh, the library needs to um, actually become a place where people can not only learn about what other people uh, have written or have thought, but also to express their own ideas. And that's uh, a little bit of what's happening upstairs where we are building an information commons, which is not going to house any books, um, but which is going to house rich technology, have staff that is um, able to assist people to learn about technology that they probably don't have in their own homes, and have databases which are very expensive, um, but which help people research and do their own writing and their own work. Well, uh, for Queens, uh, a lot of similarities with Brooklyn, obviously, and I'm sure New York. Uh, I'd also add, uh, and uh, as is the case, I'm sure, citywide, that our focus as well is, is that there is such a rich fabric of cultures from people all over the world in this city uh, that emigrate here in Queens. Uh, half the people that live in Queens now came here in the last 10 years of another country. And for the, for the last three censuses, uh, the uh, every 10 years, we find that same statistic, which tells you people are moving in, coming in through the airports or what have you, and then moving on to some other way of life. So one thing that we also spend a lot of time and focus on is programming that relates to people's heritage, their, their countries, and in creating a fabric of sharing those cultures amongst each other. So you might find in Flushing programming that would be in Irish, or you might find in Jackson Heights programming that would be uh, 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 something about learning about China or Hong Kong, areas in the Far East. So the thing that I enjoy uh, very much about what we do is I do feel like we help bring together the various cultures of people into one uh, very vibrant and uh, productive society. Tony? Uh, well, thanks, Sam. Um, I certainly agree with my colleagues. Um, Culture is infamously hard to define. I notice everyone's ducking the question. Um, um, I was once a political scientist and studied with economists, and I remember how infuriated my faculty colleagues would be because they kept saying things like, well, we don't know what it is, but we know it's really powerful. Um, so that's sort of, a, I'm going to duck the, the definition question as well, but I'll point it out that I'm ducking it. The, um, <laughs> In terms, of the, in terms of the library's role, I mean, I think it's multifaceted, as, as Linda and Tom have described. In part, it's a preservation of culture role, and certainly at the New York Public, where we have 55 million items, including you know, world unique collections of material that people come from all over the world, from all over the city and from all over the world, because we house it and preserve it and protect it and provide access to it. That's part of culture. So is providing the possibility of production of new ideas. Um, in the main building, we're talking about a new center where we'll have two to 400 additional spaces for writers that can uh, be doing the work of the mind and adding to that uh, collection that we can then store for centuries uh, forward. Um, it's also obviously the place, the library is a place of the sharing of culture, where people come, they take books out, uh, it's a place where we exhibit culture in, in galleries, in the branches, as Vin described, as, and as, as uh, Jimmy described. Um, it's a place where speakers come and, and are heard. But I would say the fundamental bedrock, Sam, is that the libraries are in the business of ensuring that there will be culture in the future. And that's because libraries are the institution in this city and elsewhere for the free provision and access to ideas and education for all comers. If we can't ensure that the next generations are learning, are inspired by ideas, are producing those ideas, have the ability to do that, then all the preservation and exhibition and sharing in the world culture will come to an end. 
That's the, I think, the fundamental mission. I'm going to try and get an answer to my next question. <laughs> <laughs> this is sort of a chicken and egg question, and the obvious answer, I guess, is both. But if you could examine it a little more thoroughly, are the cultural offerings that you uh, provide driven by consumer demand, or do the programs draw in an audience of people who then read, take out books, look at things online, and do other stuff? Anyone just jump in? I'll jump, I think a little bit of both. Yeah. Um, I, <laughs> well, yes. we have to live the in a political yes. world here, too, right? <laughs> um, I think a little bit of both in that. I'll use it as an example. Like our Flushing Library, we offer a Lunar New Year uh, celebration, and we get, at that event, we get in four hours, we get 3,000 people who come in for that program, which is a, you know, it has all kinds of events that you would expect around that type of celebration. Where in other cases, what we offer is a program might be someone uh, from Bangladesh who is on staff and has friends and their hourly rate staff of the library, and they come in and they offer a program that's more scaled specifically to that neighborhood. So there are, call it the big events that we might offer that we actually produce and we organize and we promote in a big way, then there's others that more or less come directly through the community up and into an individual branch library. Linda, Tony? Um, well, uh, Sam, this particular venue um, is filled every day with cultural offerings um, that try very hard to um, be catered to particular communities that we know have specific interests. So it varies from day to day, um, for, within any hour of the day, frankly, um, ru sometimes Russian uh, programs, where this is not a neighborhood uh, around this library that has a big Russian community. There are certainly um, neighborhoods in Brooklyn which are, but people travel here because the venue is here and this is where we can provide enough space to um, see people who want to attend those programs. Um, and at the same time, we might have um, within the branches um, smaller programs for people to actually make art. Um, we've recently partnered with an organization that encourages older people who have never had experience making art um, to get out of their homes, you know, to sort of combat isolation. Um, and to come in and express themselves with, by painting or drawing or whatever. And those are much smaller programs that we can actually do in the branches. Um, the lovely thing about libraries, whether you're talking about a neighborhood library or this particular um, main library, is that the browsing effect that happens. And it happens um, in sort of every, um, every offering that we make. Um, people come in for one reason. Um, but sort of can't help but be distracted by something that they maybe didn't intend to see, but which they, which they do happen to, um, to come across because they're waiting to get onto, in, you know, get onto a computer or because they went to take out one book and saw another. Um, it's, you know, it's similar to what happens online, only this is where it all originated. Uh, people came here uh, perhaps with one thing in mind and ended up um, expanding um, their day or their thought process or their life um, just because of, um, of happenstance. By becoming cultural hubs, is that the goal? Is the goal to draw people in uh, so that once they're there, they will read a book or go on the internet and read something? Because you can say, well, okay, the Metropolitan Opera, a uh, Metropolitan Museum, rather, has concerts. What does that have to do with art, per se, or visual art? Uh, what does rehearsal space uh, or place for elderly or young people to draw have to do with books and reading? So is the, the real purpose, the real mission, the real mandate to draw people in? Well, Go ahead. I mean, I, you know, our, our mission really is to take care of the literacy of the borough, and, and, and it really depends on how you define literacy. So we've uh, chosen um, to be, be taking the broadest definition. It's no longer just about reading a book. Um, it's about being uh, digitally literate, about understanding you know, how to communicate um, with video. And so I don't, I don't think anymore that it's a one-way street. It's not a bait and switch by any stretch. It's uh, really trying to figure out how to meet the community's needs, whether that is because you want to put a book in somebody's hand, a tablet in someone's hand, or a paintbrush in somebody's hand. Tony. So Sam, I think it's great that people come into the libraries and to the branches because they don't have books at home, or they have computers at home, or Wi-Fi. Sometimes they don't have heat or air conditioning at home. Um, but I think we, uh, we also need to be, and they want to be inspired by being with other people who are doing, doing thinking work. Uh, we have people come into libraries who aren't using the books. They just want to be inspired by the company of other people. Um, and that's a great thing in, in, you know, in, a, in a moment in society in which there's so much alienation and people separating themselves off um, libraries are a strong counter pressure to that. 
I do think we need to be proactive. We need to pull people in. We need to attract them. We need to give them educational programs, not just be passively waiting for them to walk in the doors. But to answer your question, I do think we need to, to both say, okay, we know you're excited about this thing, so we're gonna meet that interest. Um, we're gonna have a big exhibit on 42nd Street on lunch and the history of lunch. It'll be packed at lunch, right? <laughs> and dinner. But we also, we have an exhibit right now, a, a little jewel of an exhibit on Shelley and his circle, of the great English poet. Um, not everyone's gonna be drawn in by the millions. We happen to have probably the greatest collection of Shelley material in the world at the New York Public Library. So we're gonna pump it out. We're gonna put online the fact to kids, come to this exhibit, and you know what gets them? Oh, Frankenstein, right? If Frankenstein is what gets them to come in and think about great English poetry and to read that poetry, we're all in favor of that as well. And, and then we look for hybrids. Uh, up in Harlem the other day, we had a program that was a hip hop program on Greek mythology. Whatever, right? <laughs> really, whatever. Do you have to sort of stretch to draw people in like that, especially when libraries as a place to read a book arguably become somewhat less important. You can do that home. You can do it on an e-reader that's loaned out. You can do it online. Uh, how does that change the mission of a library as a repository of, of books? Our mission, that, that's a, yeah. I had a thought in my head and you just went right to it. You know, the mission in our organization, our mission statement that's been around, it's only one paragraph, it's been around at least 25, 30 years. We look at it every year or two because it is a guiding principle per se and we haven't changed it, and we always look at it and it ends up not changing. But our focus being on that we provide information, recreation, and cultural activities and interests and in books and a variety of other formats through programming as well. So programming in itself can be recreational of the mind, right? But it's also the, the key focus, I think, is that we are actually providing information to people through those programs. And another way to put it is we have programs that I would define as a little p and a big p. The big p program is something like our adult literacy program, our health literacy program, financial literacy. There are so many areas that you can go off in when you're trying to convey knowledge. So an example in one of those areas of the big p's is we're doing a lot of work to grow health literacy through partnerships with hospitals, primary care providers, um, and there's a, quite a bit of funding out there that we can reach because of that being a very important topic today. And one thing that we're doing is helping people know, don't go to the emergency room, go to these primary care providers, and this is how you access healthcare in New York City, which is a very important, it's very important information that some of us may already know, or we've got our insurance cards here, but it's absolutely there's a lot important. of people who don't. But you know? how do you justify that that's the role of a library. Yeah. Because we're conveying information to better people's lives and to help them improve the same way that Carnegie founded our organization 110 years ago as an immigrant with the whole idea being um, he wanted to see you know open access to information. Now in that day a lot of it was in book format and that would be what you would view as a traditional library. But libraries over the centuries have evolved and evolved, and whether it's through the World Wide Web or it's through e-readers or whatever that next innovation will be, um, will always be in that place. So as long as we stay core to that mission of the work, where we want to convey information for anyone who just wants to walk in the door to improve their lives, I think we'll always be staying to that core mission. I asked Tony this question earlier today, but if each of you could maybe address it yourselves personally. Uh, Arthur Sulzberger at the New York Times says he is platform agnostic. Yeah. He doesn't really care how people read the New York Times, as long as they pay for it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if they read it in paper, online, whatever the case may be. Are you platform agnostic? Do you care how people read? And how do you read yourself? That's a good question. Um, so um, I am platform agnostic, but I am acutely aware of the fact that a lot of people, a lot of my stakeholders are not. Um, 
I'll answer the easy personal question. Um, I read both um, on an e-reader um, and I like to read a hard copy book. It just depends where I am um, and what is most expedient. Um, there's nothing better than traveling and knowing that you brought the wrong book and you can just download another regardless of where you are. Um, but, but there are people who, um, who you know, really feel passionately about the book as an object. Um, we're actually trying to meet that um, interest by having exhibitions about the book. Um, we had something called Drawn in Brooklyn, which was um, an exhibition about children's um, illustrations. And all of the work in that particular exhibition was completed by Brooklyn illustrators. Um, we're having uh, something about fashion illustration coming up uh, uh, in, t in conjunction with Fashion Week in the fall. And then next year, having an exhibition about the graphic novel, which is a really interesting um, form of a hard copy book. Um, but I used to call them comic books. <laughs> <laughs> well, they've gotten very fancy, they you know. <laughs> um, but I think um, that being platform agnostic is really important because in, it's in keeping with Carnegie's initial, initial vision for um, the library as a place which levels the playing field. The idea being that the affluent had that access to information regardless of the existence of a public institution and that some people needed to have free access so that they could be as productive in their societies as some of their wealthier counterparts. Um, today it's the same, it's just that the book isn't quite as critical um, in, the whole, um, in the whole continuum of information. There are other things that are important today, especially because of unemployment, um, it's just as important, if not more important, to people to have access to the web. And in uh, and, and Brooklyn, you know, um, th th there's, 40% 40, 40 of the households actually don't have internet access at home, and so people come here for it. They get help <coughs> not only getting online, but then setting up email boxes, creating electronic resumes, um, and actually getting help in finding work. And that's driving a lot of people through our doors these days. Um, and at the same time, our circulation of books is going up, and I think that it's heartening because it's showing this uh, browsing effect that we were talking about a moment ago. People are coming in for one reason, but, but actually doing multiple things while they're here. Uh, yeah, platform agnostic for sure. Uh, you know, we all are focusing more and more on the digital world for sure. Um, with and it's not just saying ebooks, but in digital programming. Um, that's something that in fact we just had to talk about this morning um, among the three systems. Where you know there are ways that technology is going to allow us to share things among cities, not just among the, the five boroughs. Um, we're working with a vendor now that has Boston and Seattle and other cities that are all part of a, of a discovery layer from a social discovery layer for uh, access to our online resources that will allow people in various cities to be commenting on books and for kids summer reading program providing you know the kids doing book reviews no matter what city you're in so it's it's a wonderful opportunity I think with where the world is today where it's going um, and you know, in delivering information, it's, as long as we stay focused on that's what we're all about in providing that information for the level playing field um, to make this a better society, I think uh, we'll stay true to our missions. And uh, the technology gives us great opportunities to leverage it to a broader audience. Even in things like, I'll use one last example, Adult literacy, which is so important in, in New York City and, and in this country, there are, the, Ill, the rates of illiteracy is just uh, astounding. And uh, in Queens, we have 6,000 people a year that we teach how to read and write in English. We do that without promoting it to anyone. We had to actually start doing a lottery some years back because people would line up for blocks and blocks around our central library to try and get a seat. And these are people that could come from another country that have, uh, you know, where English is a second language, um, or it's people that have been in this country for 30, 40, 50 years and want to be able to read to their grandchild. And uh, so how we can help <coughs> level that playing field is 6,000 people is based on the capacity of our facilities. If we build some technology together that then allows people to come into a classroom then walk out, go through a tutorial based on their reading levels that we've assessed, and then come back in and reassess. It would allow us to increase our capacity considerably. And I know for sure we could be doing 20, 30, 40,000 people a year if we had that capacity. Um, 
So the, uh, if, if people tune into the New York Times close up next Sunday, they'll be able to hear Tony's answer. But for those who don't want to wait. <laughs> let, let me, uh, let, I've been thinking about the, the conversation since then, Sam. The, um, first, I just, uh, both of my colleagues mentioned Andrew Carnegie, so I just want to put in a plug for Mr. Carnegie here, um, <laughs> our founder. So it came up the other day, I was at an event. When Andrew Carnegie established the three New York library systems, he did so with a gift which in today's dollars, a single gift, was worth $2.7 billion. We get impressed with current levels of philanthropy. We still have a ways to go. <laughs> <laughs> Second, I want to say, in, in marrying what Tom just said, New York Public Library is the largest provider of English second language instruction and computer skills training in the city for free. It's four to 5,000 people a year in a city of immigrants, in a city where if you don't have those computer skills, you're not moving in this economy. The fact that we are the leading providers is shocking yeah. to me, given the needs of this city. To your question, Sam. Of course, people want to read in books. They should be able to read in books. People want to read on devices, they should read on devices. They can read on you know, whatever we can invent. I don't care. I care that they're reading and that they're able to read. Something like a quarter to a third of New Yorkers, of all New Yorkers, depend on the public library to be able to read because they cannot afford books. Our mission is to provide them with the access to information and to books in any format. My fear is that as information increasingly moves digitally, and the three of us are talking about this a great deal these days, we have to make sure that the bottom third of this city, of society, doesn't end up unable to afford access to quality information. We worry a great deal these days about the growing economic divide in our society, in our city. Imagine a society or a city in which the bottom third of society doesn't have access to information to read. We won't have a functioning economy. We won't have a functioning democracy. That basic mission is the same whether people are reading on books, on devices or on clay tablets. <laughs> My guess is everyone in this room or just about everyone has access to a computer, has access to the internet, uh, but as Linda pointed out, 40% or so of the people in Brooklyn do not, an incredibly high percentage, and that is one of the missions that libraries have to wrestle with. Each of you told me something today uh, that, that I found fascinating in terms of your role as a library administrator, your role as someone who has to make choices every day about how to apportion money, how to apportion money when you are inviting artists to come in and perform in a library, or to paint or create in a library. How uh, you decide, Tom, I asked Tom how many copies he was going to buy of Bob Caro's new book on Linda Johnson that comes out next month. And he said, ordinarily, maybe 100, 150. This year, maybe 10 or 15 because the money, instead of going to books, is going to staff to keep libraries open. And um, Tony is <coughs> making decisions about consolidating the Manhattan Science Business Library down on 34th Street, the Mid-Manhattan Branch across the street from the main research building. I, forgive me, I have trouble calling it the Schwartzman Building. <laughs> That's just my prejudice. Uh, but, uh, Consolidated. I'll let, I'll let Mr. Schwartzman know if you're concerned. <laughs> One of my benefactors. Uh, uh, and you're making decisions to remove books, if you will, to make room for people at the library. How do you make these decisions? What goes behind them? I'll start off with that. It's, uh, we do the same, I think, in allocating books, whether it's spaces, right, for people or for books or for programming. Uh, we continue to expand out the size of our facilities. We have a over about a 15 year period, uh, with, with the funding that we have in place right now, we'll have seen a 30% growth in our footprint in Queens. And it still won't be enough, but we have had great support from our elected officials 
in providing that the facility the money for the facilities to do that expansion out. So the you need the facilities to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. You also you need the funding, the operating budget. Capital budget has been pretty good for us in the last four or five years, even during this downturn. But operating funds, as you mentioned earlier, is down about 15%. We're facing a 30% funding reduction next year. We hope to see that all come back. But I kind of feel like in New York, we missed the boat somewhat because, because of the, the, the process, the, the fiscal process that's followed by the city. And it's historical. Somebody needs to change up this historical view and move us progressively forward. We're always working so hard just to stay even. And so much time and effort goes into that. Yep. So as a result, I used to spend $12 million on our materials budget, whether it was digital content or, or paper content. Now I'm spending four and a half million. Just think of how much content isn't available to people now, right? And as we have operating budget reductions, we had to have to reduce hours. So instead of being open every Saturday and every Sunday in every location, we have this wealth of information. This, even, even as the content is smaller, there's less access to it. In other, I would say, progressive cities and countries, um, there were some examples given by Julie about some other cities here. But I have to tell you, take a place like Toronto. Same, I use that because it's a pretty good, it's very analogous to Queens. It uh, has some of the, the the largest immigrant populations in Canada, has the same population size as Queens, structured pretty much the same way. It's an independent organization, but it's about 80% locally funded, 10% from, from its state <coughs> province. Their local funding is twice our per capita funding. So they have 18 to $20 million, and there is no conversion issue here between Canadian dollars and US dollars, okay? Yeah. All right, it's about a dollar to dollar and about twice the content. And hours of service will be on average 70 to 80 hours a week. Well, we're like at 40, fighting to not go down to 20. And I keep thinking that we keep missing the boat here by we need to start moving forward instead of just trying to stay even. And uh, we're but also, up. isn't the public cynical about that? I mean, the mayor invariably says, I'm cutting the budget for library. <laughs> Everyone you know, goes crazy and demonstrates and says, this is what the impact is going yep. to be. And then the council restores all or most of it. And people sort of shrug and say, you know, what did everyone get excited about? Oh, that's so How true. do you move it to another level yeah. where yeah. you're even and you want to get yeah. ahead? Well, let me, first of all, you're, you're exactly right. And we, yep. you know, we refer to it among ourselves as the budget dance, which sort of shows how cynical we are about it. Right. Um, but the problem is that each time there's a threat of a cut and then there's a restoration and we all sort of breathe the sigh of relief, the fact is that we're never restored 100%. And so if you look over time, especially since you know 2008, and you see that we're really operating at a significant deficit um, from, from where we were in 2008. But none of, n n not one of us is told how to, um, how to spend the money, the operating money. So we're all making decisions between collections and keeping the buildings open. And this actually, <coughs> su this subject is interesting to me, but it gets into a little bit of what we spoke when we met um, at the last panel. The library has a sense of place and what, what the physical location means to every community that has a library. And um, you, know, you can have the best collections in the world, but if you don't have the doors open at times when people can use them, it doesn't really do anybody uh, much good. Um, obviously, the internet and the website that we all are, are sort of calling another branch help that, but people really do um, uh, need a place to come, it, it, whether it's because there's a, a communal energy um, in a library that makes it a better place for you to work than in your home, or whether you actually need the access to the web. I mean, there are a myriad of reasons why people like to come into libraries, but it's a glue in the community. Consistency is really important. I think all of us agree um, that you can't um, have variability in the, oh, in the hours that a library is open, that it's important to establish a schedule so that people can count on it. And people count on us for all sorts of different reasons. We're the place where kids come after school, and it's important that working parents can, um, can rely on us for these things. And these are the sort of unspoken things that we do that library, librarians are maybe loath to speak of publicly, but which they do a phenomenal job. I mean, if you right. visit a library branch after school and you see the interaction between a librarian and the kids who come on a regular basis, it's astonishing. 
you know, a kid's acting out and a librarian shoots them a look and that kid snaps to attention. Um, and it's, you know that there's a, a deeper thing going on there. It's, it's really great. Um, and so um, all of us are forced to make these really difficult decisions about the sense of place and what that place, that glue that the library um, uh, provides to a community versus what we house. And of course, when we talk about internet access and computers, uh, one of the things that's missing in this generation too are school libraries. Uh, I remember when I went to school in, in Brooklyn, they were you know, pretty impressive in terms of the school library at every educational level, and now a lot of schools either don't have libraries that, are, that exist, that are open regularly, or that are up to date. Tony, why don't you tell a little bit about what you're doing on 42nd Street? You obviously are doing a lot of the branches in Manhattan, Bronx, and Staten Island as well, but 42nd Street, you're about to make, or proposing to make, some very radical change. So, um, look, Sam, of course we have to make choices, and, and you've heard some of the trade-offs. Even in just buying books, you have to make choices. I mean, to tell you the truth, I'll be a little outrageous, we could have our circulation numbers go through the roof. Right. Circulation numbers are sort of what librarians compare each other on. If, if we used our entire budget to buy the latest blockbuster DVD, bestseller, DVD, right, or, or right? DVD, right? And everyone could get it for free from the library. Yeah. But how do you weigh that against all the other things that we need to buy and ensure are available to the public today and for the future? At the, at, we also, not only do we have to make hard choices, but we have to make smart choices. Yeah. And, and that's what we're trying to do with this uh, new library plan on 42nd Street. The basic idea is the, 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 the Mid-Manhattan Library, which is the largest l circulating library in America, is in terrible shape. It needs repair, if not replacement. Any of you who've been in it recently will know exactly what I mean. The, um, uh, but we can't close it because three million people a year use it. We also have three million books in stacks under the Rose Reading Room in the main building, which are in jeopardy because it's a 100-year-old facility. That's our patrimony in jeopardy. We have to solve that problem. And we don't have enough money, which is what we're talking about. By bringing the Mid-Manhattan Library and the Science Industry and Business Library into the main building, into that area where the stacks currently are, we can produce something like $15 million a year of operating savings that we can then spend on the research collections, curators, and other important you know, priorities that the city can't adequately meet. And we can create a state-of-the-art, brand new, largest circulating library in the country without ever having the Mid-Manhattan closed by moving it across. And we can preserve the research collections by putting roughly half of them in better storage under Bryant Park and putting other parts of it in storage within the building. And if there are parts of the collection that basically no one is using that are digitized, people are reading, we can store those off-site and call them back within 24 hours. So we're hoping to have a better library, one that will be open till 11 o'clock at night, That'll be you know, three times the foot traffic, twice the space, you know, an absolutely state-of-the-art facility, and have more money at the end of the day to do what libraries need to be able to do. So we have to make hard choices, and we have to make smart choices as well. Let me turn to some of the questions that you've submitted. Uh, this one may be obvious, but frankly, it's not obvious to me. Why doesn't a citizen's advocacy group for the libraries exist and how can we best support libraries as citizens of New York? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> anybody, if anybody here would like to start one, I think, uh, but we would love to see something like that to uh, help us all advocate for not just funding to get us back to even, but to move our agenda forward, which is to provide free and open access to anyone in this city, no matter what their means are. And uh, it's an important mission. Yeah. It's a I very think, important I, I mission. I mean, frankly, our librarians do a great job advocating on our behalf. Um, you know, there's, um, librarians love to share, and, and there's, they do a really good job with grassroots efforts at making the case for our budgets. Um, and city council, of course, um, is also passionate about it and, and is very helpful to us in terms of getting the word out. So it's not like we're not getting 
um, any kind of, of groundswell of public support. We really are. I have some people here, though, that'll take names right over here. Right over here. <laughs> Anybody who wants to start creating that organization. There we go, Brad. I mean, I think, I think the part of the problem here is, you know, people love their libraries, and people sort of take their libraries for, for granted. granted yeah. And there's this sort of dance, as you describe it. I'm going through my first dance this year. Um, you know, and, and there's some cynicism of, well, there's threat and cuts, and then it gets mostly restored. And sort of what we don't notice, so Andrew Carnegie, I'll back to, to good old Andy, um, made a deal with the city. He said, I will build you the libraries if you maintain them. And in those days, it was, tw it was seven days a week, I don't know, 12, 14 <laughs> hours a day. Too. Yes, it's a right? contract. So we have a contract. And we celebrate, we sort of br breathe a sigh of relief when it's mostly restored. But it's sort of death by a thousand cuts, even if, you know, for all the valiant efforts of the mayor and the city council. Over the last six years, that restoration has produced a 23% reduction in the city budgets for libraries, right? So is that maintaining the contract we signed with Andrew Carnegie? Well, there's never a single moment where the contract is violated. So we don't, we don't create the sort of mass mobilization that the question is asking about. But over time, doesn't it have the same effect? And doesn't it debilitate a city that is built on access to information? I'd sue for breach of contract. Ah, there's been <laughs> But who do you sue? Yeah, there's been thoughts of that. <laughs> yeah, it's fighting the hand that feeds. Well, yeah, and, <laughs> and the contract, I assume their, their contracts are similar. Our contract says seven days a week. Yeah. Literally? Yeah, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Okay, that's what Carnegie agreed to and the city signed on to in 1901 and then 1907 for our second agreement. I didn't know that. That's a good story. <laughs> <laughs> read, the, read the New York Times. Here's the question. Uh, <laughs> libraries collect a, a lot of archival material. What are you collecting in the 21st century? How? And how do you collect that digitally? <laughs> well, the New York Public Library has 55 million items. We have you know, some of the most extensive archives, special collections, unique collections in the world. As I said, people come from all over the world to use it. And we are increasingly digitizing that collection. But it, we estimate that if we tried to digitize the entire collection, it would cost us billions of dollars, right? So we, again, have to make choices. You know, what is it that we should digitize first that more people will want access to? And one of the things that's fascinating about the digital transformation, so I'll give you an example, Sam. It, I, I, this happened before I got to the library. The, the New York Public has this amazing collection of menus from restaurants in the 19th century. Who knew? But we do. The, um, so we could afford to take pictures of it and put it online, but we couldn't for, uh, afford to do metadata, as we call it in the business. We couldn't afford to actually enter the material so that you could search it and move it and analyze it. So we put the pictures up online. And we said, anybody interested in going at this? And within three weeks, something like 200,000 people had gone on in their free time. It's unbelievable. Wow. And, and voluntarily entered parts of menus into metadata so that other people could use it, right? I mean, this is sort of community service That's or Wikipedia. civic life. It's like Wikipedia, right? Well, given the alternatives, I have, a, I have kids, so the alternative of sort of mindless games, right, that you can actually help, you know, build culture, right, by entering it in a way that the library can't afford to and make those priceless and unique collections available to everyone forever. I mean, we haven't even begun to think of the ways to do that. What do you do with stuff that is already digitized, in effect? One of the great things I have looked at on paper is when you go to Thomas Jefferson's draft of the Declaration of Independence and see the notes and see yeah. slavery crossed out or things like that. Can you do that when you collect things digitally now? Sure, sure. We, yeah. I mean, we have that draft in the New York Public Library right. collection. That it is available here. digitally. 
I'll give you another example. The, sorry, the New York Public Library owns one of the original copies of the Bill of Rights. I'm embarrassed to say it hasn't been shown in public um, for too long. We're about to fix that. The, um, I asked to see it, um, as anyone would, and anyone might digitally, or we, they'd come and see it as well. So I look at it, and, and the first thing I say is, well, you've been had. It's a fake. Right? I'm not a constitutional expert, but there are 12 amendments here. I know there are only 10 in the Bill of Rights. Right? Lo and behold, when George Washington sent it around, Linda knows this well, she is a constitutional scholar, there were 12 proposed amendments. He could only get 10 passed. Not only did I not know that, but amazingly, they chose the right 10. Not everyone, not everyone seems to believe in all 10 of them at the moment, but leave that aside. The, so the document, the physical document, seen in person or seen on your screen, teaches a powerful lesson about how democracy works and that democracy works in a way that nothing else can. Yeah. It's like Mel Brooks in History of the World. Here's a question, speaking of technology that was tweeted, uh, when faced with difficult financial times, collaboration can be key. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to how the three systems can work more effectively together? Well, I'm I think the three, the three of us are, are new at this. Um, we're, well, Tony and I are, are new to the library, and Tom has been a great um, um, supporter of this effort of the three of us to figure out how we can operate more efficiently so that we can spend our dollars um, better serving the public. And we're just beginning a process, um, but we're examining every way um, that we're doing business in hopes that we can use our scale um, to do it more efficiently, to do it more economically. And I'll, I'll, I'll give a shout out to the Revson Foundation and to Julie Sandorf as well because um, she and her organization have been behind this from the start. Um, there's, there's really no reason why with three separate library systems with three very different identities, you know, um, Tony's been talking about the 55 million items um, in the New York Public Library and the whole archival um, function that that library uh, plays. Brooklyn Public Library um, does not have anything like that and, and frankly um, doesn't need anything like that because uh, of what the research libraries in, in Manhattan do for the city of New York. But all of us have a very significant and fairly complicated um, back of the house operation that allows us to circulate and move books and materials around the city of New York and um, all of us are dedicated to figuring out how to make that happen efficiently. I think for the first time Ever. It was so great to get the three of you together last fall for what might have been the first time. And I asked this question, but I think it's worth repeating for the audience too, or repeating the answer. Why do we need three separate systems? We all meet, uh, well, I'll, first thing I want to say is that we started our day at 8.30 this morning in a meeting of the three systems working on ways that we collaborate, and here we are at the end of the day uh, meeting again. Where were you um, at lunch, Tom? Yeah, 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 yeah. Tony, Tony and I were together. Okay, yeah. So, okay, so there was a whole mix in between, right? So, I mean, there's so many areas. I mean, I'll take digital and ebooks, for example. I mean, that's an area where the three of us working together, whether it's with publishers, in building an ebook delivery system, I mean, we have scale individually above and beyond what you'll find in lots of states the, for an entire state. So we in really terms are. Purchases and yeah, for and, purchases and, 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 for our, and, and yeah, for our capacity. I mean, not to pick out, pick out Wyoming or what what have you, but I know someone who runs a state library in Wyoming, and every time I talk to her, she tells me we're like four times bigger than her entire system just in Queens. Um, so the point being is that when the three of us get together on an initiative to be able to move something forward, we really can drive the industry in a number of ways. So we're looking at that, whether it be in our distribution systems or whether it be in our ebook and electronic delivery, digital content, um, working with the Department of Education and how we help deliver uh, better services with the schools together. So there's a lot of, I think there's, the thing that's wonderful about this job, at least for me, and I've been working at it, I'm in my 25th year now. It's only been, uh, was it nine years as the president, but in a senior leadership role, no matter how many things you think you just got done today or this month or last year, there's always more on the plate that come up every single day. 
But and the challenges are always there. And uh, I think we have, New York City should be so proud of its libraries um, and all that they accomplish. And our people, it's all of our, our staff, it's not like we do, you know, I'm, we're a bit of ringleaders in a way, right? <laughs> but when I sat here, I gotta tell you, when I sat here and I saw Julie speak so passionately about what library is about, you can't imagine how many doors she's opened for us to help partner and move things forward. Or Jimmy Van Bramer, who's doing the same thing on the side of government, right? We have people that help, that are so strongly behind us to move our agenda forward. It's, it's just so encouraging. So it's surprising because um, I thought for sure that Tom was actually going to answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> because this question in particular is really near and dear to his heart. He just lost the train. Why do we need three separate library systems in the city of New York, I think was the question. And um, I think part of the answer is um, something which we alluded to earlier. We serve such an incredibly diverse set of communities here. Um, that we have um, different areas of expertise and we're actually trying to share them with each other. But, um, and and uh, we can talk about who's better, you know, Tom's great at buying books in Urdu and, uh, and we do a great job buying uh, Russian language materials and Chinese language materials. And I saw your Urdu book. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, but we, what, we've, what we've concluded is that um, we have areas of excellence that we should share across the systems but we also have significant differences that while we may be able to blend some of the back of the house operations, it's important for us to have um, distinct um, um, can, I, can I just add that, uh, you know, I think we should celebrate, going back to culture, that there are distinct cultures in the boroughs, yeah. right? Within the boroughs and of the boroughs, and we should celebrate that and, and as long as it doesn't get in the way of us doing as good a job as right. we need to do. And again, Julie's been really our cheerleader and, and pushing us along, uh, which is exactly right. You know, my, in our first weeks, my first weeks on this job, one of the first thing we agreed on was a joint amnesty for school kids who had accumulated fines, 100,000 kids who couldn't use the libraries. And the three of us got together and said, that's crazy. We want kids to be able to use the library especially those who can't afford to pay their fines back. So we did an amnesty. Now we're in conversations, as mentioned, with the Department of Education about, you know, is there a way in which the three systems can collaborate to meet the needs of the public school system, which is having trouble meeting the library needs within the schools? Um, and can we do that together? So I think the test should be, by cooperating, can we actually get more done? And the answer seems to be a resounding yes in the back of the house and in the front of the house. Let me ask a quick last question. How do you measure success in each of your library systems? Uh, is it circulation? Is it people coming? Is it books taken out? It is, what is it? Yes. OK. Um, <laughs> when, no, no, you know, when, when, when I got I'm tired of answering my own question. <laughs> no, when, when I arrived here, um, you know, everybody spoke and, and still speaks largely about circulation. And fortunately, it's a metric that uh, continues to increase despite all the predictions about how um, libraries would become obsolete. Circulation is at an all-time high. And so we still do well to measure success using that statistic. However, that's not a statistic that will serve us well in the future, nor is it one, I believe, that actually measures how well we're doing. Because program attendance, um, literacy rates, um, and, and, and you know, we're, we're actually trying to work through what the metrics should be. Um, to measure our, our success. Um, I think that you know, the obvious ones, attendance at programs, uh, the turnstile, the number of people in and out of the libraries um, are all critical, but we'll have to come up with something as the way people access information continues to change. Oh. You know, I'll throw in on top of that things like customer engagement or community engagement and relevance. I, I think that you know, there's a chicken or egg factor here, but the better we are <coughs> at meeting people's information needs, the more they're going to support their public libraries, which creates that ability for us to get more people who will donate private funds for elected officials to support us because they know the communities are behind us. So as long as we're doing our job, which is understanding what people's information needs are, their cultural needs, their recreation, all those things that are part of that mission, and we're effectively delivering that, which we do through surveys and all kinds of other metrics, right? But if we're doing our job right, we should be able to see ongoing growth, ongoing relevance, which in itself breeds more success. I'm going to uh, just... So uh, that's, 
Yeah, I'll just jump in, and this is one thing I sort of holler at everybody on my staff never to do, but um, the, the fact is that in a time when the economy is difficult um, and all of our metrics are at an all-time high, we're seeing um, a decline in the amount of money that we're able to spend per capita, which is really kind of crazy. It's an inverse, which goes to Julie's, point. Goes right. to Julie's point, exactly. So we're not just about bad economic times, but we're certainly needier now than we. Than well, we another were. basic basic metric is how many hours we're open. Yeah. I mean, that's just ac that's just access to the physical building, yeah. which is so important. Well, so. Uh, look, I think uh, metrics are all important. Some of them are are very straightforward, like hours open, uh, amount spent, which it basically translates to how many books and how much staff that you have. Some metrics are more complicated. I, I was a college president before, so I know just how much bad metrics can lead to <laughs> bad behavior. Um, you know, and circulation has its pluses and minuses in that regard. Since we've talked about all the metrics that we should be judged by, let me just say, for me, the metric is going up into the Rose main reading room and seeing every seat filled and people inspired. It's, it's going to the library branch in Inwood where I grew up and seeing every seat filled and asking people what they're doing there. And I remember it goes back to culture. I mean, we think about grand culture and, you know, we have NYPL live events and the most unbelievable high culture and in New York at the New York Public Library and at Queens and Brooklyn. But I, I remember when I was thinking about this job, going back to my old branch and wandering around and I came upon a guy who was a recent immigrant uh, from Latin America and I asked him what he was doing there. And he said, well, you know, he didn't have any books at home, uh, living with seven other people in two rooms. And I said, well, what do you do here? And he, he said, I come in every day at lunch and take out a picture book so that I can see paintings of angels. For that guy, that was the height of culture. And I'll take that metric of success together with all the hard numbers to continue to do what we're doing. Tom Galante, Linda Johnson, Tony Marks, thank you for you and your thank dedication. You. Thank you. Thank you. To Vince Capola, to and thanks most of all to you for caring enough to come. Yeah, thank you so much.